All right, physiology students, welcome back to another exciting night of class. Um, tonight we'll be going over part one in chapter 12. It's a very lengthy PowerPoint, um, but we're probably going to just spend maybe half an hour going through it. And I'm going to pick out the parts that I want you guys to know from part one. And then um, on Tuesday of next week, we'll go through part two as we're kind of working our way through the module here. Um, what you guys have due for Sunday is an open note, open book quiz due on Sunday. So that's Sunday at midnight. Take that quiz. It's on chapters nine and 11. And take some time learning that material well and those answers and what makes the answers right and wrong because you might see those questions again or questions like that quiz again on the lecture exam. And then in the announcement section, I posted this week in class a little bit, but also Physio X instructions because you have the Physio X exercise two, which is skeletal muscle physiology. Um, that is the lab that will take you through skeletal muscle. So you guys are going to be pros by this point, hopefully on skeletal muscle physiology and knowing how they contract, but you do have to do all seven lab activities. This link takes you to a recording of instructions of how to get to the PhysioX labs. And then this link is one that I just made tonight about how to save your lab report as a PDF. And you can upload each, all seven lab reports individually because you'll have one lab report for each activity. Or there's a lot of great free um, PDF merger websites where you just drag your PDF files and then they will merge the file for you into one. Um, question. I don't think it saves your progress, Valerie. That's a good point. I don't think there's a way to save it. Um, I mean, I wonder if you leave the window. Oh, I think if you leave your window open and as long as you don't close it, it should be there. But yeah, you probably want to at least do an activity. Um, I know I would probably do at least one activity in one sitting. So then you can save that activity. And then before moving on to the next one but it will take you some time. So please get started on that PhysioX lab. Please don't wait till Sunday as I'm sure some of you might, um, but get started on it right away. So you're doing a lot of muscle work in your labs, but we're kind of working our way through the, um, the nervous system in lecture. And the nervous system is a little bit hard to take in all at once because it's a lot of material. Um, so this part one of chapter 12 goes through the central nervous system and then we'll go through this now. And again, there's 113 slides in part one. We won't be going through all of them. So if you guys are with me, just highlight things or take notes on things that I talk about. Um, so your central nervous system consists of the brain and spinal cord and part one, we're just talking about the brain tonight and then part two will be the spinal cord. So the adult brain has these four regions, the cerebral hemispheres, the diencephalon, the brainstem, and then the cerebellum. And then this PowerPoint takes you through those four regions of the adult brain. And then, so big picture, just keep reminding yourself that there's four regions to the adult brain. Um, as we work our way through this. So brain development, um, I just include this picture because this shows how the adult brain of structures and convolutions is kind of um, developed in the brain. I kind of take out the embryological development. So we don't look at brain development in the womb, just in the adult. But here are the cerebral hemispheres. The diencephalon is kind of in the center of the brain. If we were to kind of pull back the cerebral hemispheres and look at the center, the cerebellum is in the back part of the brain. It's kind of its separate posterior inferior part behind the cerebellum. And then here's the brainstem. And the three parts of the brainstem are shown here, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. And you should know those three parts of the brainstem, but we will come back to that too. All right, let me get out of here. Thanks. All right. Okay. Here we have brain regions and organizations. So a little bit about brain regions themselves. Um, we divide your brain matter into gray and white matter. Gray matter is non-myelinated neurons and white matter contains myelinated and non-myelinated, but what gives it the white color to white matter is the myelin. In the basic pattern found in your central nervous system, there's a central canal filled with cerebral spinal fluid and that's surrounded by gray matter with white matter external to it. 
Um, there are some changes though, as we look through the central nervous system. And what the following slides kind of go through is just how the gray and white matter are distributed in the central nervous system. So here's a cross section of the spinal cord. You have the central canal kind of surrounded by this H shape of gray matter with the outer white matter around it. And again, the gray matter is what makes up our neuron cell bodies and our unmyelinated neurons. And the white matter is mostly myelinated axons because the white matter will have all the tracks where the groups of axons going up to the brain are coming back down. The brain stem has additional gray matter nuclei that are scattered within white matter. And we'll come back and talk about why those nuclei are important. And then the cerebral hemispheres of the cerebrum and the cerebellum contain an outer layer of gray matter called the cortex. And we're gonna talk about the cortex a little bit because this is, the, this is the very thin layer of gray matter that's on the outer side of the cerebrum. So here's a cross section um, of the brain stem showing the central canal and the dispersion of gray and white matter. Um, you can see the kind of the regions of gray matter. Those are the gray nuclei. I won't ask you guys too many questions about this. You know, how is gray and white matter distributed in the central nervous system? I'm more just showing this to you because it's good for you to see how our central nervous system is made or, you know, the, how the gray and white matter are distributed throughout. So what makes the cerebrum different? different? So this is the cross sections showing um, this cerebrum is that it has this outer layer which is very thin of gray matter, and that's called your cerebral cortex. And it, that cerebral cortex has special functions. It's a very thin layer of gray matter, and then the inner white matter with gray matter as the brain nuclei kind of scattered throughout. Our brain has ventricles in it. Maybe you remember this from anatomy. Uh, ventricles are fluid-filled chambers that are continuous to one another and to the central canal of the spinal cord and they are filled with cerebral spinal fluid and lined by ependymal cells. And you should know this, it's a type of neuroglial cell that lines the ventricles. There's paired lateral ventricles that are the C-shaped chambers. Each lateral ventricle is connected to the third ventricle and the third ventricle is connected to the fourth ventricle. And I'm just gonna show you a picture showing you in blue are all of the ventricles of the brain you can see you have lateral ventricles here, one in each hemisphere. So think of this as ventricles one and two, and then we call the third ventricle, the third, because it's our third ventricle, um, connects the two together. It lies right in the middle of the brain. The third ventricle then is connected to the fourth ventricle via the cerebral aqueduct. And the fourth ventricle lies right in front of the cerebellum, as you can see there, before it continues down as the central canal that goes down the spinal cord. So those are the ventricles of the brain. They have cerebral spinal fluid, um, which helps to give buoyancy to the brain and helps with delivering nutrients, getting rid of wastes and so forth. So the cerebral hemispheres form the superior part of the brain. Um, this is what you think about when you think about 83% of your brain mass. There are different surface markings, which again, I hope Maybe some of you remember this from anatomy. If not, it's okay. Um, you guys have a lot going on. The gyri are the ridges, so the brain folds of the cerebellum. The sulci of the cerebrum, excuse me, the sulci are shallow grooves between the gyri, and fissures are deeper grooves. So we have the longitudinal fissure, which goes right down the sagittal kind of plane of the brain that separates the two hemispheres from each other, right and left and you have a transverse cere cerebral fissure that separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum in the back. So here's a look at the longitudinal fissure separating the right and left halves of the brain. Um, this kind of also is labeling the different lobes, frontal, parietal, occipital. You see these brain folds. I'm just gonna kind of go over one that's a gyri. And then you see depressions between the two is a sulcus. Here's a look. Um, at the different lobes of the brain and how the transverse cerebral fissure um, separates out the cerebrum, which is on top from the cerebellum below it. And you can see here right in front of the cerebellum is the brain stem and the different lobes. So we have several sulci or those shallow grooves that divide each hemisphere into five lobes, which are shown here. 
And you should know where these lobes are located. And you should also know just really simply um, what the general function of each lobe is. That will be a part of a test question. The first four lobes are named after what skull bone lies over them. And the insular lobe is buried under portions of the temporal, parietal, and frontal. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So here are the frontal lobes. They're all kind of labeled different colors. Um, you can see fissures kind of showing the difference between the lobes. And I think um, the next picture will show the insula. So what we've done is we've kind of pulled apart the frontal lobe and the temporal lobe uh, to show the insula lobe, which is kind of deeper within those lobes. So you have major sulci that divide the lobes. The central sulcus is the major division that separates the precentral gyrus, which is on the frontal lobe from the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe behind it. And you have other sulcuses here that separate out other lobes. And each hemisphere has three basic regions, the cerebral cortex, which is the most superficial part of the cerebrum, the white matter, which is more internal, and then the basal nuclei, which are deeper and kind of scattered throughout. Um, so here we have this central sulcus, which divides the frontal from your parietal lobes and the gyrus or brain fold or ridge right in front of that is called the precentral gyrus. And that's a part of the frontal lobe. And the postcentral gyrus is a part of the parietal lobe. And I focus on these two gyruses because they each have very specific um, functions that you will need to know. So the cerebral cortex then is the outermost thin superficial layer of gray matter of the cerebrum, it's called the executive suite of the brain. And this is where all of our conscious, conscious mind control happens. Awareness, sensory perception, voluntary motor initiation, communication, memory storage and understanding. Um, so again, this is all occurring in the thin two to four millimeters, most superficial layer of the cerebrum. And we can look at PET and MRI scans um, which are a type of functional imaging of the brain that will show specific motor and sensory functions located in discrete areas called domains and higher functions are spread over many areas. So this is just a look at the cerebral cortex and how different um, imaging can look at where uh, what part of the cerebral cortex will be activated when that person is seen or focused at looking on something focused on hearing, focused on speaking, and focused on thinking. And from imaging images like this, we're able to see what part of the brain and what part of the lobe is important for what function. So here's the cerebral vortex. It contains three types of functional areas, motor areas, sensory areas, and association areas. Um, each hemisphere of your brain is concerned with contralateral side of the body. So that just means that what your body senses from the right side will be kind of integrated on the left side of the brain and vice versa. Um, and we'll go over some of this and I'll try to focus on parts of this that I specifically want you to know. I do want you to know that the motor areas are all located in the frontal lobe. So your frontal lobe, uh, your forehead is all motor areas and that acts to control voluntary movement and the primary motor cortex is found in that precentral gyrus, which is that ridge right in front of the central sulcus. Um, there's a Broca's area and a frontal eye field as well. But what I want you guys to focus on is the motor areas are found in the frontal lobe and the primary motor cortex in that precentral gyrus. So you're going to see this picture come up a lot. And um, this is a good picture to study because there is, I think, one or two just matching questions on your exam about where is the primary motor, motor cortex located, um, where are some of these association areas located, where is vision located in what lobe of the brain, hearing, um, so the auditory association area. And we're going to go over these now, um, but just keep that in mind. This is a kind of the, the most important or the big part from part one is learning where in the brain some of these functions are occurring. So the primary motor cortex, again, is located in that precentral gyrus. I just mentioned that. Um, it uses different types of cells to allow for conscious control, a precise skilled skeletal movements. These are 
pyramidal cells with pyramidal tracts, which will take the axons down the spinal cord to the part of the body that they're controlling. And you don't necessarily need to know those pyramidal cells or the pyramidal tracts. But one thing that's interesting that you guys might find interesting is we use what we call a motor homunculi, which is an upside down caricature drawing representing the contralateral motor innervation of the body region. So what we're looking here on the left side of the, this cortex, we're looking at the precentral gyrus. So we are in the primary motor cortex. And what this is showing is medical professional scientists have figured exactly along the cerebral cortex of the primary motor part, which part of the brain controls the motor movements of which part of the body. And this, we're looking at the left side of the brain. So this left side of the brain, this motor cortex will control the parts of the body on the right side. So look at how much brain kind of area is given to your hand and fingers. So there's a lot of control in your hand and fingers because your brain has pretty much just as much control or area of the brain that's dedicated to the control of your hand and fingers than is dedicated maybe even less to the shoulder and arm, which are larger parts of the body. So these are just caricature drawings where we can determine this is important if someone has a lesion in the brain, a tumor, and a part of their body is not working correctly, well, they can go and say, well, that makes sense because that part of the brain is damaged. The same thing happens in the somatosensory or the sensory part of the brain. So on the right side of the picture, it's showing the sensory map. And the sensory map or sensory function is located in the postcentral gyrus of the parietal lobe. And again, this is just showing the parts of the cerebral cortex that can respond to sensory information. And again, you have a lot of sensory information just in your hand and fingers. Um, so you have a lot of precise sensory information and control in your hands and fingers. So again, premotor cortex, it helps to plan movements, skilled motor activities. It controls learned, repetitious, or pattern motor skills. Anything motor related, voluntary actions, again, Premotor cortex is in the frontal lobe in that precentral gyrus. Broca's area and frontal eye field, I won't ask you questions on, but the Broca's area has to do with your motor speech area that directs your muscles of speech production. Um, and the frontal eye field controls voluntary eye movements. So again, here's a look at the picture that we're going to come back to as we're going through this. Um, and this takes you a look at a sagittal view of this picture. So we're moving half of it. Um, damage to the area of a primary motor cortex could be seen as a stroke and it could par paralyze muscles controlled by those areas. And again, paralysis always occurs on the opposite side of the body than the brain damage because everything is oppositely controlled. Uh, muscle strength or the ability to perform discrete individual movements will not be impaired, only control or the, over the movements will be lost. So then the sensory areas, um, we have a lot of different sensory areas in the cerebral cortex that you should know. The primary somatosensory cortex is located in the parietal lobe. Um, in different parts of your parietal, insular, temporal, and occipital lobe, we have different kind of sensory areas. And you should know some of these. Um, so the primary, primary um, somatosensory cortex is located in that postcentral gyri of the parietal lobe. So get that in your head. The motor cortex is in the frontal lobe and the primary somatosensory cortex is in the parietal lobe. And this is what will receive general sensory information from skin and proprioceptors of all of your muscle joints and tendons. Um, and it, we, again, we show the same hum, hum, homunculus, which has this caricature type drawing showing where on the cerebral cortex is controlling what body part. The association cortex of somatosensory is directly posterior to it, and that just helps to integrate different sensory input. Um, then we have some visual areas that you should know. You should know where the primary visual cortex is located, and that's located in the occipital lobe. And um, generally, your occipital lobe is all for vision, um, but that's where the primary visual cortex is located. Uh, the association area, which um, again, the primary visual cortex is where, um, you know, most vision occurs or that receives the exact kind of 
visual information from the retina. And then when we talk about an association area, think more of interpretation, that vision. So um, this association area will then interpret the visual stimuli. Primary auditory cortex, you should know where this is located in the superior margin of the temporal lobe to help interpreting sound as pitch, loudness. The auditory association area is then directly behind it. And again, whenever you see an association area versus a primary auditory area, um, the association area more works at integrating things. So this would be storing memories of sound, for example. Vestibular cortex, this helps with conscious awareness of balance. I don't think I ask you for that, but it's located in part of the insula and right next to the parietal cortex. The olfactory cortex, you should know, it's located on the medial aspects of the temporal lobe. Um, so this has helped involving in the conscience, conscious awareness of odors. Gustatory cortex is taste, and that is in the insula. And visceral sensory area, which has to do with um, sensory um, sen sense information from your organs, um, is directly behind the gustatory cortex. All right, so that I tried to focus on what you should know from that. Um, if we damage the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe, that could result in functional blindness. Um, or if we damage the association area, the individuals could see things, but they could not um, integrate it or comprehend what they're looking at. Okay, so from here, we have even more association areas. Um, I include this because sometimes students want to study more on their own, not often, um, but these are more in association areas that receive multiple sensory areas. And I won't ask you too many um, specifics about this. Um, and I'm just going to double check that. But um, I think what I've covered so far is what kind of you should focus on. So I'm going to skip over some of this middle part of the PowerPoint. Um, some of these association areas are involved with understanding written and spoken language. That's called a Wernicke's area, if you ever hear that word. And then the limbic system, um, it's, it provides emotional impact um, and it helps with a lot of our emotions. Uh, this goes through tumors that can be, or any other lesion, lesion in the brain or some sort of um, part of the brain that is broken or um, diseased. This could cause mental and personality disorders, including loss of judgment, attentiveness, or inhibitions. Um, another problem could arise, you know, with someone with another association area might not understand to wash or dress. Um, so again, just the brain is such a complicated organ and we just have to respect it and especially respect the problems that are associated with it. The cerebral cortex lateralization is the division of labor between the hemispheres. They're not identical. About 90% of us have more of a left-sided dominance and that usually results in being right-handed. So that's why most of us are right-handed. Um, but in the other 10%, the roles of the hemispheres are reversed. So that's why about 10% are left-handed. Um, there are different hemispheres for left and right kind of skills or abilities. Usually the left hemisphere contains more language, math, and logic, and the right hemisphere contains more intuition, emotion, artistic, and musical skills. So the idea that someone is right or left brain, there is some truth to that. Um, cerebral white matter then is the second of the three basic regions. It's responsible for communication between the two. Um, we, it consists of myelinated fibers that run into tracks. And I just want to show you what these fibers look like. So this is just how the white matter communicates with each other. And you don't have to know all these tracks. I'm going to skip over a lot of information here. But I like to show this to show you how the brain functions as a unit. And these tracks of white matter that are showing in different colors here show the tracks of axons running together just showing how different parts of the brain are always kind of communicating and working together as a unit. So those are the white fiber tracks. The nuclei is the third of the three basic region of the cerebrum. Um, these nuclei are scattered throughout and they have lots of different, each kind of grouping of nuclei has a different function that I don't focus too much um, in this course, but those are called basal nuclei. And again, each kind of grouping of nuclei has a separate function. So again, if someone has a lesion or a tumor, 
in this part of the nuclei, it could affect some of their muscle movements, cognition, emotion. Um, for example, Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease is actually a disorder of these basal nuclei, these groups of ganglia of gray matter scattered uh, throughout the brain in the deepest parts. So those are where some of those nuclei are located. Uh, the diencephalon really simply is composed of these three gray matter structures, and they're all enclosing or surrounding the third ventricle. And this is where they are. We have the thalamus, um, the hypothalamus, and then the epithalamus is behind it. So all kind of surrounding the center of the brain around that third ventricle. Um, the thalamus is a bilateral egg-shaped nuclei, and it's shown here, and it has it's kind of has two halves to it, it has different nuclei in it. And the thalamus is the most important because it's the relay station for information coming into the cortex. So your thalamus is important because it will sort, edit, and relay all ascending input. So any sort of impulse from memory, sensory integration, it takes all sensation, it acts to mediate sen sensation, motor activities, arousal, learning, and memory. Your, your thalamus kind of sorts it, it edits it, and filters it, and then sends it off to the right place in the brain to go to. The hypothalamus is located right below that. We're going to talk about your hypothalamus a lot when we get into your endocrine system because it connects to your pituitary gland to help control hormone secretions. So that's your hypothalamus. Um, and here are some selected structures showing, again, the different clusters of nuclei in the hypothalamus. Um, and again, it controls your autonomic nervous system and your emotions because it controls a lot of hormones. All right, and then I'm gonna, hypothalamic disturbances can include some of these. And then the last part of the diencephalon is the epithalamus. It contains the pineal gland, which secretes melatonin that regulates our sleep-wake cycle. And that takes up the diencephalon that makes up the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and then the epithalamus is behind it with the pineal gland shown right here that regulates your sleep-wake cycle by regulating or secreting melatonin. And this is just another look at the diencephalon. Um, you can see the two lobes of the thalamus here in purple. So that's your thalamus. The hypothalamus is located um, right below it. So you, this is just kind of a view of the diencephalon and below it is the brainstem that we'll go through next. All right, the brainstem, what I need you to know from here is I need you to know the three regions that make up the brainstem, um, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. Um, and that's your brainstem. You could see it coming out here. Here is the midbrain. Here is the pons, which is kind of the anterior little raised bump in front. And then the medulla oblongata will be the most inferior part of the brainstem that's continuous with the spinal cord. So these three parts make up the brain stem, which just connects the spinal cord uh, to the brain itself. All right, so the midbrain is the first part. You don't have to know too much about the midbrain, just that it's located between the diencephalon and the pons. Um, it has peduncles, the cerebral aqueduct runs through it. Um, it has gray matter with, that's associated with some cranial nerves. Again, not, don't worry about knowing too much of this. Um, this is kind of what the midbrain does um, with different types of nuclei. The pons then is the second part of the brainstem. Um, it's located between the midbrain and the medulla oblongata. It has different conduction tracks, which again will kind of control where um, axons are going into which part of the brain. So that's the pons. It has an origin. So from the pons, we have cranial nerves coming off. We have cranial nerve five, six, and seven coming off of the pons. And it's shown there with showing the trigeminal nerve coming off of it. And then the medulla or medulla oblongata blends with the spinal cord at the foramen magnum. It will be where your fourth ventricle is. And it's just the third part of the brainstem. So other than knowing that those are the three parts of the brainstem, that's pretty much all you need to know. The brainstem is made up of the midbrain, uh, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. 
An important part about the medulla oblongata, we sometimes see the crossing over or the decussation of pyramids, which is just where ascending or descending tracks going up to the brain will kind of cross over to the opposite side. And different cranial nerves come off of the medulla as well. All right, and I think um, I'm almost done with what I want you guys to know from here. You can read through on your own about what are the functions of the medulla oblongata do. And I think we kind of end with the cerebellum. Um, the cerebellum, again, is the inferior posterior part of the brain mass. Um, it processes input from the cortex. And what it is important for is to provide precise coordinated movements of skeletal muscles. So it helps to play a role in balance. So that's our cerebellum. Um, it has different hemispheres, folia, um, arbor vitae, Purkinje fibers. I'll just show you a picture um, because beside knowing where, besides knowing where the cerebellum is located and what its function is to help with balance, that's pretty much all you need to know about the cerebellum. We call these arbor vitae, so arbor for tree. These almost look like um, kind of white matter tree branches. And if we cut the cerebellum sagittally, we see kind of the inside arbor vitae distribution of white matter and gray matter surrounding it. So that is the cerebellum and how it's connected or where it lies right behind the pons in the midbrain. All right, it has cerebral peduncles, which show exactly where it connects to different parts of the midbrain. Um, and I think that's pretty much it. I won't ask you questions about processing or cognitive functions. And so I think I'm gonna end there. This just shows you it's kind of a different character to drawing where parts of the cerebellum will control parts of the body in fine coordinated skeletal muscle movements. So thanks for listening to part one, guys. Um, and we'll do part two of chapter 12 on Tuesday. And I hope you have